Hi everybody, once again it is your AP Biology teacher Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our Unit 7 on Natural Selection by getting into Topic 7.4 which is on Population Genetics. Hopefully it's been well established at this point that evolution and natural selection don't occur in individual organisms and they occur in populations. Okay, so really what I, I've been alluding to this a couple times already but evolution is occurring if the gene pool of a population just changes from one generation to the next. That's evolution, okay, on the smallest scale that there is. On the larger scale, we're talking about the, the four and a half billion history and something called speciation, the formation of new species that we'll get into much later in this unit. Um, but really what we're, what we're getting down to here, the, really, the basis of evolution here is microevolution, a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. Micro means small. This is the smallest scale at which evolution can occur. And all it means is that the allele frequencies, which is referring to how frequently an allele appears in a population, changes over generations. Okay, so if you got one generation, well, I'm going to walk through an example here in just a second. Okay, but that's, that's really it. If allele frequencies change from one generation to the next, evolution has occurred. Okay, so here's my population of organisms over here, my, my blobs over here. Okay, let's just say, you know, uh, the, um, at one particular locus here, 70% uh, of the gene for A is the dominant allele, and 30% of the gene for A is the recessive allele. Okay, so out of all of the alleles in the population, if they all have two, right, if they're big A, big A, big A, little a, or little a, little a, homozygous, heterozygous, or well, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive, okay? If 70% uh, of all the A alleles are big A or dominant and 30% of all the alleles are recessive, little a, okay? Um, and that just, that changes from one generation to the next. And here we go. Oh, I meant to do this slide first, okay? But if it goes, you know, if it shifts just a little bit, okay, it goes from 70-30 to 63-37, that's evolution. That is microevolution, just a simple change in allele frequencies. Okay, so there's five different ways that that can happen. Okay, and how we're going to memorize them is by using our hands here. Hello. Okay, uh, so if you're taking notes, I encourage you to draw your hand or trace your hand. Okay, and then we're going to uh, walk through our, our hand here, our five fingers of evolution. It's a, I'm stealing it from uh, Paul Anderson of the Bozeman Science video series. So shout out, shout out, Doctor or not Doctor, Mr. Anderson, for this great idea. Um, I've been, been teaching this way using the five fingers of evolution for years. Um, it's available from TED Ed. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to use our hands to memorize our five different ways that allele frequencies can change from one generation to the next. Uh, so natural selection is the main driver in the cause of evolution. Okay, so we've established that, but it's not the only way that allele frequencies can change. Okay, natural selection is a big one, okay? Individuals with the best traits are gonna survive and reproduce and pass down those traits, and that's going to change the allele frequencies in a population, okay? But it's not the only way that that can happen. Allele frequencies can change in four other ways, okay? And we're gonna use natural selection to describe our thumb, okay? Because natural selection approves of plates that help it survive, traits that help it survive, and does not approve of traits that do not help organisms survive, okay? So that's what, the, that's what we use the thumb for. But these other four fingers, okay, they represent genetic drift, sexual selection, mutation, and gene flow. Okay, we know what mutation is, um, but those other three might be new. So let's get into it. Uh, we use our pinky, hello, pinky, to represent genetic drift. And genetic drift is the process by which chance events cause allele frequencies to fluctuate unpredictably from one generation to the next. Okay, so uh, take a look at this picture over here. We got uh, we got beetles. A lot of them are a lot of them are black, have a black shell, um, and some of them are these red spotted ones. Um, but let's just say some kind of chance events happens, and here's our population. Wham! Um, a good portion of them are wiped out. Okay, take a look at our allele frequencies now. That is definitely changed from one generation to the next, um, and. That's microevolution. The allele frequencies change from one generation to the next as a result of this chance event, this random foot coming in saying goodbye to a good portion of the population. Um, so the smaller a population is, 
the larger the effect that that genetic drift is going to have on that uh, on that population. Okay, so if I had you know a population like ten times greater than these, what is that? Eight beetles. Okay, if I had eighty beetles over here, and then the foot only wiped out five. Okay, then that means that it's not going to have as big of an impact um, on the the entire allele frequencies of the population. But if I wipe out five out of only eight, okay, that's a huge impact on the gene pool. Okay, I'm eliminating a lot of different genes and I'm eliminating a lot of genetic variation as a result of this chance event. Okay, so genetic drift is non-selective, meaning that it's random. It's a chance event. Okay, nobody knows where that foot is going to land. Nobody knows like what's going to or which organisms are going to be wiped out by some kind of massive volcanic eruption or extinction event or something like that. Um, and genetic drift can cause harmful alleles to become fixed. Okay, uh, so that's a that's kind of a bad thing. The uh, what is it called? The prairie chicken used to be all over the state of Illinois, where you know I'm currently living right now. And if you're watching, you're probably from Illinois too. Um, but there used to be a really large range of these uh, these prairie chickens, and uh, they're really rare now. Um, because of a bottleneck effect that we're going to talk about here in a second, but a genetic drift, a good portion of them were wiped out, and the ones that have that are left have really not good alleles um, that are cause disease and make them susceptible for um, a lot of other factors and put their lives at risk. So yeah, here's genetic drift once again. Okay, if we got 75% blue, a population 25% red. This is our spread of alle well, these are phenotypes over here, but you get the idea. Um, our allele frequencies are going to change due to a chance event. That's what genetic drift is all about. Okay, two kind of subsets of genetic drift. This is the one that we're going to talk about the most. Are the founder effect. Uh, when few individuals become isolated from a larger population, a smaller group may establish a new population whose gene pool is different from the source population. All right, so if this is a, this is a group of organisms, all blue circles and red squares, okay, and then a small group of them leave the population, Okay, the new population is going to have way different allele frequencies um, than the original population. That's the, called a founder effect. Okay, so this is, if this is an island and then you know these are other islands, our allele frequencies are going to be different based on a smaller group. Um, a real story, um, a real story of this happening was you know 15 British settlers in the early 1800s. Uh, they settled on an island. Um, you know, f far away from everybody else, and there's only 15 of them, and a gene for having retinitis, a type of retinitis, so like an inflammation of your retina, um, was kind of unusually pre prevalent in that group of uh, group of 15, so that the subsequent population that grew up on that island, this gene, this mutated gene that allowed for retinitis was way more prevalent in this new colony that only stemmed from 15 people, okay? So that's a perfect example of the founder effect. They founded this new colony on this new island, um, but this gene for having this, this retinitis was far more prevalent, and it became more frequent. Um, the allele became more frequent in that smaller population, okay? Another example of genetic drift is what we call the bottleneck effect, and this is the more sad one. Uh, when a population's size is greatly reduced, causing some alleles to be overrepresented, underrepresented, or absent. Okay, so here's an image. We call it the bottleneck effect because we take a, a lot of a really big population, and if we only cut it down to a very small population, okay, that means the allele frequencies are going to be very, very different. Um, so that's what happens to a lot of different types of wild cats, particularly one called the Florida panther. Did you know there's panthers in Florida? Bet you didn't. Well, maybe, I don't know. But uh, yeah, the Florida panther underwent a bottlenecking event, the same as those prairie chickens that I was discussing before. Um, and these individuals have way less genetic variation than they used to, and in inbreeding occurs, and it's just a really, really bad scenario um, for this tiny population of Florida panthers. They have to breed with each other to, in order to pass down their traits, but a lot of them, you know, have the same alleles. Okay, so that's a bottleneck effect, and that's another subset. That's another um, that's another version of genetic drift that can occur. Okay, uh, so your next finger, okay, genetic drift. We we use a pinky to d discuss it because it affects small populations the most. The next one is uh, the ring finger, which represents sexual selection. 
Okay? When individuals with certain inherited characteristics are more likely than other individuals of the same sex not to just survive, but to mate. Okay? So it's not just about who can survive the best. It's about who can reproduce the most, right? That's what fitness is, okay? Is making sure you can reproduce and pass down those traits to the subsequent generations, okay? And a big part of that is mating for a lot of different organisms, okay? So we use the ring finger to represent sexual selection because, you know, it represents a couple, right? Like, I got my ring on, right? Uh, like, yeah, that's a... Uh, yeah, that's what we use it for. Okay, um, so individuals with more attractive traits that allow them to make them more likely to mate are going to reproduce. So like this peacock, right? Peacocks made Darwin pretty pretty upset because for a while he really didn't understand like, okay, why would a peacock like this have these ginormous feathers that make it hard for it to run and it can't even like fly more than 20 feet? Um, why would it ever have that? It doesn't help its survival. It helps its reproduction. Not its survival, it helps its reproduction. Hey, this guy over here with these beautiful feathers is going to be more likely to reproduce um, and find multiple females to mate with. That's what peacocks do. It's like a, it's a whole thing. We'll talk about it another time. Okay, but one male peacock is going to mate with like 10 female peacocks. Okay, and whoever has the best feathers, whoever is the most attractive, is going to be more likely to pass down their traits. That's sexual selection. Okay. Uh, mutations. Okay, we use the middle finger to represent mutations um, because mutation and middle start with the same letter. They both start with M, right? But mutations, um, they also drive, you know, changes in allele frequencies. Okay, they they're the basis of genetic variation. And remember, genetic variation is the uh, it's it has to be there in order for natural selection to occur. But okay, but uh, mutations themselves change allele frequencies. Okay, that's just what it does. Okay, it, it changes allele frequencies and it introduces brand new alleles or brand new genes into a population that is ultimately going to change the allele frequency of a population. It's the ultimate source of genetic variation, new phenotypes, and it provides phenotypes on which natural selection acts. We already know that, okay? Um, and they're random, right? So it happens by chance. Mutations happens by chance. Natural selection does not happen by chance, okay? That's something to, that's something to remember. Um, but yeah, if you get a new gene, that's going to change allele frequencies. Okay? And remember, mutation middle. The last one that we're going to talk about is gene flow. And we use the pointer finger to represent that because okay, we can indicate direction, something leaving or something going. right? And gene flow is the transfer of alleles in or out of a population due to the movement of fertile individuals or their gametes. All right, so we got the population of brown beetles over here, and they're, they have their own gene pool. They have their own allele frequencies. Hey, but if this guy over here says, hey, I want to join this population for whatever reason, um, both uh, this, this gene pool has definitely changed. Allele frequencies have definitely changed um, within this population. That is gene flow. And thus, you know, evolution has occurred. Microevolution, allele frequencies change in a population. That's microevolution okay, due to gene flow. Allele frequencies change when individuals join or leave a population. All right, so the last um, image that I'm going to leave you with here, okay, we've got population A, selection pressure against recessive phenotype has created a homozygous population. Okay, but if, they, if some alleles joined the other population, okay, then allele frequencies have changed. Okay, so we got all homozygous recessive over here, all homozygous dominant over here. Okay, but if... Uh, Birds from each population end up breeding with each other. They're going to in, they're going to change the allele frequencies. Okay, this population might have the introduction of a dominant allele. This prop, um, population is going to have the introduction of a recessive allele, so on and so forth. Okay, that is it for this video. Hopefully, I didn't ramble too much. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you next time.